back. Yes, it sounds like we're back. Um, Sarah, are you nodding because you can hear us? Yes. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right, we'll Thank continue. You. Uh, Director Gavin. Director Gavin. Uh, Director Here. Borman. Here with sound. Thank you. Thanks. Director Groven. Here. Director Holt. Here. Director Lewis. Yes. Uh, Director Melvin. Here. Director Pang. Here. Director Ross. Here. Director Sager. Chairman Dillard. Coming back to Director Cotel. Here. Uh, 15 present, one absent, Mr. Chairman. That's great. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. And we uh, have a quorum and have a physical quorum uh, in the uh, Board of Directors uh, room here on the 16th floor at, at our offices. Um, item four, uh, or actually item three, it's the approval of the minutes from the board meeting um, held on June 16th of 2022. Any comments or corrections to the meeting from that date? I don't see any. So how about a motion and a second to approve the, the minutes? Uh, Director Melvin um, moves that we approve the minutes, uh, seconded by uh, uh, Director Canty. And with that, um, Jeremy, let's, uh, this, this will be interesting. Let's take a roll call and we may as we go on, although we will, when we get to the contract uh, approval, we're gonna take a, a roll call on all of those. But Jeremy, take, uh, take the roll call and we may have a baseline roll call. Sure. We'll see how it goes. Uh, Director Andalcio. Aye. Director Canty. Aye. Director Carey. Aye. Director Colson. Aye. Director Fuentes. Aye. Director Gavin. Aye. Director Gorman. Aye. Director Groven. Aye. Director Holtz. Aye. Director Cotel. Aye. Director Lewis. Aye. Director Melvin. Yes. Director Pang. Yes. Director Ross. Yes. Uh, Chairman Dillard. Yes. 15 ayes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And the minutes are approved from the June meeting. Um, item four is the public comment segment of the meeting. We've asked the public to submit their comments via electronic mail, and any comments received will now be read into the record by the board secretary. We receive any comments? We've received no comments at this time. Right. Sure. Thank you. Anybody in the audience present that needs to, uh, to, to wishes to speak at this point? I don't see any. Thank you. So let's move on to item five, the executive director's report, Leanne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Board of Directors. I should say more likely, welcome back. Um, it is kind of good, a little odd to some extent. We were joking that it seems like the first day of school where everybody kind of knows where to go, but we're sort of still a little bit off our game. So appreciate those of you who are able to make it down and appreciate those of you online uh, joining us as well. Uh, it's it's good to be back. I know there's some people here that had actually not physically met and some of the others in person until today. So uh, hopefully there'll be a few more minutes at the end of the meeting. So those of you who are not new to the board, but new in terms of being back here can get together and, and chat for a little bit. So um, it's been a busy two months since we last met uh, as a board. Uh, and I think there's been a lot of work that's done, that's happened around the strategic planning effort that we're undertaking. You're going to hear more about that in the actual um, uh, staff presentation later on. But I just wanted to highlight um, kind of some key takeaways that I think have been really important out of that work. And I think um, our investment in engaging a broad audience uh, has really paid off. I know some of you have actually participated in some of those meetings, so are aware, but uh, there's been really three key areas that I think we've really gained some uh, really valuable um, learnings and, and, and act, um, experience, I think. And the first one really is an expansion of our audience and our agency's capacity to do meaningful engagement. Um, and then secondly, I think it's been that we now have an agenda of items that are urgently important uh, to advocate for and actually to start to implement on. And then finally, I think one of the key three takeaways is that we really have what we see as a growing coalition um, of supporters and advocates that we believe are going to be fundamental for continued support as we not just finalize the strategic plan, but move into implementation and execution, and ultimately our um, you know, funding issues that we'll have to tackle over
over the coming couple of years. So I think that's really important. Um, later in our meeting, our strategic planning team are going to provide you a full update on the work. I'll just pause because online people can't hear me. Testing, testing. I can hear. I can hear also. Well, same here. I'll keep just testing. Testing, testing, testing. Trying again. Nope. I mean, we can tell when they're live because they're coming through the speakers. We can hear you. You can hear me? Oh, we're back. Yeah. Can't can hear you. Okay. Something random is happening with this, but um, the strategic plan team will actually give you a full update on uh, the work that's happened over the last three months, several months. We are also uh, encouraged by the uh, CTA's recently released meet, uh, Meeting the Moment Action Plan, which addresses five key uh, areas of rider experience, and Dorval Carter uh, unveiled those at City Club, I think it was just last week. Uh, so that's a, a good action plan that they've also come out with recently to sort of chart their work forward over the coming months. Uh, so moving on to the next slide, please. On the legislative side of things, uh, first from Washington, I think most of you probably know, uh, President Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, presents us with significant investments uh, in climate and zero emissions technology. Uh, some of the key components, though, as they specifically relate to transit, includes the uh, extension of tax credits to encourage uh, transition to clean energy. It also provides uh, $1 billion for the uh, EPA to make grants and rebates to replace Class 6 and Class 7 uh, heavy-duty vehicles, so that includes actual buses in the transit space, so that's good news for us. Uh, the grants also may pay up to 100% of costs specifically in some key areas, including the incremental cost of replacing eligible vehicles with zero emission vehicles. Um, also purchasing, installing, operating and maintaining zero, in, uh, zero emission infrastructure, as well as workforce development and training around zero emission vehicles. And then finally, for planning and uh, technical activities to support the adaptation, the adoption and deployment of zero emission vehicles. I think that's really important, some of those latter points that uh, are incorporated in there, because it's not just about buying the physical buses. In some respects, that's kind of the easiest part of this transition. Uh, and I can tell you for my involvement with our National Association, this has been a point that the transit agencies, municipalities and many others have been advocating for and talking with Congress about. So it's great that they've heard that and have recognised that and now have actual money uh, behind uh, those pieces of transition. It also provides $3.2 billion to the Federal Highway Administration to establish a new neighbourhood access and equity grant program. And it will provide competitive grants to states, local governments, uh, uh, tribal nations, public authorities with transportation functions and metropolitan planning organisations with a focus on improving walkability, safety and affordable transportation access. It's also going to support the mitigation or remediation of the negative impacts from surface, surface transportation facilities that create, have created in the past an obstacle to connectivity uh, within a community or even a source of pollution or other burdens to disadvantaged or underserved communities in regions. And then finally, uh, that uh, additional monies that the 3.2 million will be available for uh, planning and capacity building in disadvantaged or underserved communities. So again, sort of broadening out sort of the purview of what a highway department may have done in the past to think about how do we not only just provide transportation facilities but improve access to them. Uh, there's also a set aside of 40% or 1.2 billion of these funds specifically for disadvantaged communities. And funds may not be, I think this is an important point, that funds may not be used for projects that result in additional through travel lanes for single occupant passenger vehicles out of this actual funding package. So that's um, advantageous to public transportation. 
So it really presents, I think, some opportunities for regions like us to tap into some of those dollars. So next slide, please. Uh, the local planning front, uh, so our local planning staff with the service boards uh, recently selected 10 projects for what we call our access to transit program. And that provides funding to local municipalities to complete engineering uh, construction for small scale capital improvements that improve pedestrian and bicycle access. So it's sort of our mini version of what I was just talking about at the federal level. Um, and this is the sixth round of funding that we have done this actual package of projects. Uh, this round, we had 16 applications. We approved 14, uh, from 14 communities, I should say. Uh, for the approved projects, for the 10, uh, money is going to Ford Heights, Harvard, Harvey and Maywood. Uh, and they will fund phase one engineering and RTA is actually providing 100% of those funds estimated at about $153,000. The remaining six projects uh, in this package uh, are going to Bellwood, Berkeley, Cary, Elburn, Harvard and Plainfield. And they'll fund phase two engineering and construction uh, pending our uh, application for our CMAC funding, which is a different federal funding program. Uh, that application, we'll, we'll know more about that next year. So that's, we would move and fund those projects as well. Uh, a variety of improvements to the multimodal environment, really all around transit stations, bus stops, uh, crosswalks, sidewalks, pedestrian heads, you know, multi-use pathways, bike parking, uh, bus stop improvements, and importantly, ADA accessibility improvements. That's the kind of projects on a small scale that we fund as, as part of this program. So next slide, please. So in addition uh, to the strategic plan update that I just mentioned, uh, today on the agenda, RTA Transit, we'll hear from uh, Jackie Forbes on the Citizens Advisory Board. Uh, she's our chairperson for that group and she'll give you an update. We will have a triennial, uh, an update uh, from Colette Holt, uh, who will give you an update on the triennial dis disadvantaged business enterprise goal that we will be setting for 23 through 25. There'll also be a quarterly performance report uh, for the second quarter of the year. And then we'll be looking for your vote, your action on uh, the second quarter financials, the pension trustee appointments, uh, third, uh, three contract approvals as well. Uh, so that's the full agenda. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Any questions, comments for Leanne? Excellent. Been a while since I've talked to real humans. <laughs> Except for my kids, you know, who don't listen. <laughs> I love it. All right. As Leanne mentioned, uh, the next item is item 6A, and that's an update on the activities of the RTA's uh, Transit Citizens Advisory Board and Jackie Forbes. So, good morning. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Chairman Dillard and members of the Board of Directors. Thank you for your time this morning. My name is Jackie Forbes. I am the chairperson of the RTA CAB. I'm here to provide an update of the activities of the board. The RTA CAB last met on July 25th. During this meeting, RTA staff provided an update of the progress that has been made on the development of the next regional transit strategic plan provided a briefing on the purpose of the 10-year financial plan technical group for the regional strategic plan and the progress that group has made, and provided a briefing of the RTA's Transportation Tuesdays virtual events that were held during the month of July 2022. Since today the RTA board will hear about the progress being made on the development of the regional strategic plan, I don't want to be duplicative, so I will just share some suggestions that came from the RTA CAB members on the action areas to prioritize when developing the plan. These include adapting the transit system to meet riders' changing needs, designing a system that increases access to job opportunities via transit, simplify and integrate payment systems across CTA, Metra, and PACE, including expanding this system to community-based paratransit services, ensuring full accessibility of the transit system, 
Improving real-time travel information, including providing it on the ADA paratransit system and the county-sponsored paratransit systems, such as Ride and Kane and others. Regarding the work of the 10-year financial plan technical group, RTACAB members suggested looking at ways to further leverage the tax on cannabis or lobby to increase the percentage of sales tax or gas tax that comes to the RTA as a means to increase public funding to compensate for the loss of operating revenue. The next meeting of the RTACAB will be held at 10 a.m. on October 24th, 2022 in this room. And this concludes my report and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Jackie. Any questions or comments, suggestions, um, please pass along to uh, the CAB uh, our thanks for, for their input, which is always excellent, and, and their time. And thank you very much for, for spearheading this and giving us your time. All right. Well, thank you. Seeing no love. Thanks, Jackie, very much. Uh, we will uh, move on to 6B, which is an update on the uh, strategic plan, including the work of the stakeholder and technical working groups and a discussion about key areas for action and advocacy for 2023. I see Jill's getting up there, Jessica and others. And Jill, you can take it over and introduce uh, the other, other members uh, who uh, will give input uh, as well. Sounds good. All yours. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Uh, I'm Jill Leary, the Senior Deputy Executive Director for Capital Programming and Planning and the Chief of Staff, and I have with me Jessica hector Sue and Peter Kirsten, who are um, members of our strategic planning team leading this effort. Um, and we are here to give you a brief update on the plan's progress since your last meeting. Next slide, please. So as we have been discussing with you for many months now, COVID has permanently changed our region and its transit system. Transit provided an essential lifeline throughout the pandemic and is currently providing about 900,000 rides per day. But often it does not serve riders as well as it could, and its historic funding model that is very dependent upon fares paid is no longer sustainable. You've shown us that the RTA is committed to change, change that will meet not just this moment, but change that will help us prepare for what is next. For the last year, we have been working with the stakeholders from across the region to establish a vision informed by a 10-year financial plan for the system. Through this effort, we have developed priority goals and strategies and are growing a coalition ready to work with us to achieve them. We are here with you today because we hope you will join us in supporting the handful of ideas that we are ready that are ready for advocacy and action in 2023 and looking for your feedback. So today we'll spend most of the time talking about that list and continuing to refine it with you. Next slide. As you are aware, the strategic plan we're now developing has been progressing along three concurrent tracks over the past year, a financial planning track that will develop a 10 year financial plan alongside a strategic planning track both informed by an engagement track to ensure transparency, accountability, and mutual learning with a growing body of stakeholders. We are now in the middle of this process and we are working to develop the content of the plan. Next slide. Before we dive into the priorities that have emerged from the goals developed by the working groups, it's important to take a very quick step back and look at the context in which we're developing this plan and the challenges that the system is facing. First, remember that funding for transit in our region comes from two main sources, which in the last decade were largely sufficient to balance our operating expense. The first is public funding, which is primarily the RTA sales tax, as well as the state public transportation fund and some other state and local sources. Overall sales tax has performed much better than expected during the pandemic and is in fact currently well above pre pandemic levels. The second source is operating revenue which is primarily the fares paid by riders on the system. Prior to the pandemic, system fare revenues exceeded $1 billion per year. In 2021, it was less than 400 million, a reduction of 600 million from pre-COVID levels. Thankfully, federal relief funding has been, been provided to essentially replace that large revenue loss. 
Next slide. This chart shows average weekday ridership by mode for a typical week in May. CTA, Metro, and PACE are now consistently serving 900,000 trips on a typical weekday in 2022. This is far more than 2020 or 2021 at the same time, but we are still about 50% of 2019 levels. This slow recovery of ridership and related fare revenue has created ongoing operating budget shortfalls. This is affecting not, our re not only our region, but other transit systems across the country and the world. Next slide. When we take the funding shortage that is resulting from less ridership and start to look at it over the next 10 years, we start to see some real challenges ahead. This chart shows a range of financial scenarios that have been modeled by our 10 year financial plan group that is being led by our staff member, D Doug Anderson. The graph can be read from left to right, starting with 2022 and extending across the 10 year forecast timeframe to 2031. The bold black access axis across the slide represents a balanced budget with a deficit of zero dollars. Expenses and revenues are in balance. The financial scenarios are represented by the colored lines. The green lines represent assumptions related to more favorable conditions, red lines more negative conditions such as weaker economic performance. The bold blue line is the baseline or the middle of the road scenario. As you can see quickly, all the scenarios extend below the bold axis, representing future projected budget deficits. Under the baseline scenario shown in blue, the region could expect a budget shortfall of around $730 million by 2026. The assumptions we have collectively made for that scenario is that sales tax remains strong, but that ridership will remain below pre-COVID levels, such that there is not enough funding to cover expenses when federal relief funding runs out. A 700 million plus regional deficit is quite a daunting figure in almost 20% total of our projected revenues. This is a projection and is likely to change as we move forward and learn, learn more about the recovery. But I'm sharing this up front to emphasize that our work of developing creative solutions, and most importantly, the will to implement them, is very much so being done in the midst of knowing this significant disruption of transit funding is coming. So that is an overview of the moment that we find ourselves in. <laughs> Not all that rosy, but we'll work on that. Um, and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Peter, uh, to talk about the work that we've been doing on the, the plans development. Thanks, Jill, and thanks to the board for having us here today to provide an update. Um, go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> so uh, recall that about a year ago, we kicked off um, the process of engagement. Uh, we spent the first six months of work doing broad engagement with input of hundreds of people to develop a vision principles and desired outcomes. Um, and based on that input that we received, we developed the following vision. Uh, safe, reliable, accessible public transportation that connects people to opportunity, advances equity, and combats climate change. Next slide. Alongside uh, the vision are three principles that will continue to guide our work. Those are equity, stewardship, and committed to change. The vision and principles have been the central criteria for guiding the goals and strategies that we have developed since. Next slide. Um, from these vision and principles, we've also developed these six future outcomes. Three outcomes are related to what we want our transit system to be, and three relate to the type of region that a great transit system can help build. So in the future, our transit system will be safe, accessible, reliable, useful for riders, in a state of good repair, and financially stable. And that will contribute to a region that's connected winning the fight against climate change and thriving. Next slide. To develop the plan elements, we convened three stakeholder groups, uh, each tasked with recommending goals and strategies tied to the outcomes uh, for the transit system and the region that we're aiming to achieve. Additionally, there are the two technical groups, the 10-year financial plan group and the priority projects group. The technical groups are still engaged in their work and both aim to produce a memo documenting both their process and outlining their recommendations. And those will be complete in September. We'll give you a quick update on the technical groups and their progress before discussing next steps on the stakeholder work. Next slide. The priority project group continued to meet through the summer to discuss capital program priorities. 
composition of this group includes RTA staff and service board staff, along with staff from CMAP. Uh, they actually just had their last meeting this week and are working on a memo to summarize their work. Uh, the priority project group recommendations include continuing the priority project process that was established in the previous plan, Invest in Transit, uh, developing 12 evaluation themes with accompanying metrics to assess projects that are proposed for inclusion in the five-year capital program. Themes include access to key destinations, climate impact, racial equity, and mobility justice, among others. And lastly, continuing to improve transparency with riders and the public through sharing more information about the service board's internal capital programming processes and results, uh, as well as the RTA's effort to compile the regional program. Next slide. The 10 year financial plan group uh, is also continuing to meet uh, through the summer and mirrors the composition of the priority project group. Um, this group has two meetings left and have developed a number of products that will be documented again in a memo to be uh, completed in September in September. Uh, these products include modeling transit funding and revenues across the planning horizon. Uh, scenario analysis to understand how larger factors will impact transit funding and expenses. Policy solutions to potentially address funding gaps. Uh, and discussions about potential long term changes to statutory recovery ratio requirements. Again, the work of both of these groups will be summarized in forthcoming technical memos describing both the process that they were engaged in uh, as well as the, the recommendations of each group. Next slide. So circling back on the stakeholder groups, um, recall again that we've convened these three stakeholder working groups, each tasked with recommending goals and strategies tied to the outcomes for the transit system and the region. The working groups followed a very deliberate process meant to prioritize mutual learning and input from diverse voices. Each group was led by members of RTA staff and included representation again from the service boards and CMAP, as well as from organizations and communities across the region. The stakeholders, uh, stakeholder groups are now complete. Uh, each group has produced a memo kind of documenting the process as well as pre presenting their recommendations. Um, and these memos are being prepared for distribution by RTA staff and will be online uh, later this week. Next slide. On August 9th, RTA hosted a hybrid movers workshop with in-person and virtual options uh, for participation. Uh, recall the movers group is a wider audience of stakeholders, many of whom participated uh, in the working groups, as well as uh, some stakeholders that did not. The event included a moderated panel on the working group process uh, and recommendations uh, that featured working group members directly hearing from them, um, as well as a workshop discussion where stakeholders were prompted to discuss kind of the specific goals articulated by the working groups. We'll talk more on that in a moment. Uh, there will be a blog post uh, in this week's newsletter with details about the event and a link to a video recording of the panel. Next slide. Two comments from the panel I want to highlight uh, both speak to the importance of cultivating a diverse regional audience for engagement. Um, first is from Re Rebecca Mendoza from Pre she's the president of Evanston Latinos. Evanston Lat Latinos was founded in May 2020, so we are very new to this. And I was impressed that the RTA was able to find us. Pause for a second. Test, 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 test. Not. Test, 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 test. Are you giving me the thumbs up? We can hear you. Okay. I'll try to speak up. Uh, so the first quote uh, from Rebecca Mendoza, president of Evanston Latinos. Evanston Latinos was founded in May 2020, so we're very new to this. And I was impressed that RTA was able to find us. I did think our voice was very important because of the time that we were formed and the group that we work with. Uh, we work with immigrant and undocumented mixed status and primarily Spanish speaking community members in Evanston. They were part of the group that was essential workers. It was a pleasure to be included uh, to share a little bit about their experiences as a part of this process. Next slide. 
And then a second quote from Scott Hennings, who's the Assistant Director of Transportation at McHenry County Department of Transportation. One of the reasons I got involved in this plan is simply because I think we are stronger as a region when we work together instead of uh, on our own unique silos. It is important too that the outcomes of this plan are representative of all corners of the region, not just the city of Chicago, not just Cook County, but including all the collar counties as well, which have very different transit needs than the more dense parts of our region. Next slide. So all of the work of the working groups, including these final memos that will be posted this week, uh, are on a hub website that we created. Uh, the website was an in integral tool during the process and remains an archive uh, of the group's efforts. Um, we're working to organize this material for eventual, eventual inclusion in the plan's appendices. Um, but beyond the appendix, uh, this website is kind of where and how the heart of the plan was developed. And with that, I'll pass it over to Jessica. Peter. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everybody. Good to see you. I'm Jessica Hector Sue. I'm the Director of Planning and Market Development here at RTA. So uh, all told, these working groups created 20, go ahead and go to the next slide, created 28 goals and 131 strategies, which is a lot, uh, but a good thing. Um, to date, none of them have been eliminated, and we hope to carry them forward into the plan somehow. Um, but today we want to talk about 14 priority areas that we think are ready for action in 2023. We think that this is something that we should focus on over the next couple of weeks, and that's, again, what we'll focus on here. So on to the next slide. Um, the 14 items really came from a few things. Um, they came from where we see some urgency, where we see some collective energy from multiple organizations and actors, and really, frankly, where it's practical for us to do something in 2023. So, you know, we're, we're really discussing the list right now. If we think that there are things missing and there's some energy to add some things, we can add some things. Likewise, if we think there are too many things and we need to take some things off the list, we can do that right now. Um, we've already made some adjustments actually to the language and the way that we're talking about it, even based on the meetings we've been having in the last couple of weeks in that movers workshop that PK was just mentioning. So there are changes that we can make at this point, but we wanna talk with you all about it. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, we've, we've structured the list around two different types of activities. The first is advocacy and the other is action. They're, sh they're both shown on this slide. Um, all of the ideas come from the working groups. The, the things on the advocacy list are really things that are longer term, more substantive changes to how transit works in the region. And they're really things that we can't do on our own. We need our stakeholders to step up and really take the lead on them. So the fundamental to this is seeking new revenue for transit. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. The action ideas on the right, that we're talking on the right slide, side have the potential to be a little bit more immediate. Um, they're not necessarily easy, but they're things that will meet the unmet needs of riders and changing needs of riders. And they're things that the RTA and the service boards could likely take the lead to implement with, of course, the, stake, the support of our stakeholders and all of you. So we've, we really view this agenda as a package of items that really go hand in hand together. Um, the advocacy items uh, are essential to the actions and, and vice versa. They're really not meant to be taken one at a time, but they all really need to happen together. So you have the list at your place printed out, uh, and it's also posted on our website for the folks who are listening online. So let's go ahead and talk through them together. Go ahead and move to the next slide. So let's look at the advocacy areas first. To achieve our vision, we really must advocate, we think, to A, secure increased funding for transit operations, to B, develop a budget less reliant on fares, but instead focused on expanding access to opportunity. C, build a coalition around the value that transit brings to the region. D, support communities' efforts to improve the areas around their transit stations and stops and pursue equitable transit-oriented developments. E, engage with communities in an inclusive and transparent way about how transit dollars are spent in the Chicago region. F, secure increased funding for transit infrastructure. And last but definitely not least, partner with roadway agencies to build more transit-friendly streets and advance bus rapid transit. So again, this is a list of advocacy items. So these are things that we need stakeholders to help us accomplish. The full list is here on the slide and you have it in your hands. I'm gonna pause here for a minute and see if you have any comments about the list or about things that you think are particularly urgent or important on here. Go ahead. I, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for the first three 
that are on this list. Um, when I joined the board in 2020, these are, these are things that I talked about, was this idea of changing the way we see success of public transit to become uh, less dependent on the number of riders and on what we're actually providing and changing the way that uh, we view public transportation in the state. So I'm really excited uh, to see these three things at the top of the list. And it gives me hope that we can then go back in and re-examine you know, recovery ratios and, and the way that we fund these things. So thank you for making those top priority. Yeah, thanks for that feedback. Others? Director Carey. I want to camp on to what Director Canny said. Um, when I look at the seven, there are at least four that deal with funding in one way or another. And uh, F, secure increased funding for transit infrastructure, talks about a hot button for me, which is um, going for some of the money, or at least educating uh, the leaders of our state that when you talk about transportation, not all the money needs to go to roads <clears throat> um, and to facilitate more cars on the highways, that we need to look at it as one big bundle. And there shouldn't be just an IDOT excuse me, I that focused on roadways. We need to look at that and carve out the part that belongs to transit. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Um, I'm glad to see on D uh, with uh, equitable transportation. Um, as we know, with the current workforce um, being as low as it has, a lot of people with disabilities have opportunities that they normally didn't have. So I think it's important that we, we address that issue now because these jobs are becoming available now. And, and I'm glad to see that we're actually taking a, another step towards making more stops. And again, you know, one of the goals has always been making sure main routes have been accessible as much as possible. Um, so uh, I'm glad to see it's on the list. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that feedback as well. This is very helpful to hear from you. Other thoughts on this list? Items that might. Director mention. Gorman has a comment. Oh, great. Yes. Yes, thank you um, for this presentation and for the update. And um, it's great to see the, the funding, you know, areas, you know, as mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, in, in looking at the vision, you know, safe, reliable system, it, you know, we can't have reliable systems unless we have safety um, on that. And that seems to be an area of concern, especially with you know, trying to uh, get ridership back to where it needs to be. Is there a area where safety would fall under, you know, any of these areas? I see partner with roadway agencies to build the more transit friendly streets and advance bus um, under G. Would that, you know, fall along that area or is that would that could be addressed in a separate area? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that's actually a great segue into the action areas. Do we have any other questions online? Yeah, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, let's look at the action areas. So these are things that we think that RTA and the service boards could take the lead on. And these include, first and foremost, make the transit system safer and more secure for everyone. Uh, we'll come back to that in, in your question, Director Gorman, but let me go through the whole list. Um, the second one is to use new funding as a catalyst to create a fully accessible transit system. The third is to provide more accurate real-time inf travel information for riders. Hearing a lot about that right now. Uh, the fourth is to make paying for transit more seamless and more affordable. The fifth is to accelerate the transition to a near zero emission regional transit system and prioritize communities burdened by poor air quality in the process. The sixth is to assess the regional capital program in a new way including considerations for racial mobility, racial equity and mobility justice. And the last is to adapt bus and rail service to meet the changing needs of riders. So again, these are action areas that we think we can take action on as the transit system. Uh, obviously, any of these require the port support of our stakeholders. We can't ever do anything truly with, on our own, but, but these are really for us. So um, to your question, Director Gorman, yeah, safety is number one on this list, and it's definitely something that we've heard loud and clear. CTA spoke a bit about that last week in their city club speech, and it's something that we're we're talking to the service boards about. Do you want to add anything, Jill or Leanne? No? Okay. Yeah. So uh, any thoughts on this list? Again, action areas that we can take. Um, anything missing from this list? Anything that you'd like to see added? Go ahead, Director Lewis. I'd just like to uh, compliment you on um, item four in the action list. Uh, we've been talking about the need for 
uh, a seamless um, transportation uh, element between all the various um, uh, agencies so that a rider can theoretically, you know, hop on a train in the suburbs, catch a, a CTA element in the city, and then take a pace uh, bus to their final destination. So uh, the universal fare card was, I think, the, the word that was used in the past, but it seems like this got this has elements of all of that in there. So I commend that for being on the list, and I'm glad we talked about it before um, uh, in terms of what might surface up from the various work groups. So I'm encouraged to see that it did surface up and it is a priority because I think that will be a key success factor for engaging the public in transit uh, as we go forward. So just wanted to, to mention that. Yeah, thanks for that input. Yes, our working groups talked about this one a lot, actually all of these items a lot. And that was that was a key point of discussion. Go ahead, Director. Um, I'm glad to see number five, um, you know, reducing the, you know, air quality, zero emissions. I think that's absolutely important as we move forward. I know I wrote a report on an SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm glad to see that's being addressed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the, the raising of the Sustainable Development Goals. That's really something that we have not talked a lot about. So we saw that uh, input from you, and we want to make sure to include that as we go forward. So thank you for that. Other thoughts on this list of action areas, items that really appear to be urgent or important to you or things missing, things that should be added? Thoughts? Just, just uh, one quick comment related to these action areas, these two lists. Um, even though these, the service boards have been integral parts of all the working groups and the development of all of this at this point as well. But I have also been meeting with the executive directors of each of the service boards individually on a monthly basis to kind of keep them updated and apprised. I know they're getting briefings from their staff, but I think it's important that they hear it from us too. So I have been meeting one on one with them and actually we will be coming together to convene as a group in the coming month or so uh, to continue that conversation because this is a conversation going forward about translating that list into even the action item items into real actions and sort of how does that fit into and where are they at in certain um, elements of their own programs and plans so sort of pushing all this together and pushing it forward is i think been really important for us to continue to do yeah so there so this list will continue to morph over the next few weeks and months as Leanne has those conversations with the executive directors of the agencies as we meet with stakeholders from across the region. On the next slide, there are some specific ways that people can continue to engage. The first is that we'll be uh, releasing very soon a public input survey that will ask for the public's input on these 14 items. Uh, that will be coming soon. We will also be conducting, already are conducting some rider interviews at events throughout the region from now through October. The first one was last night, I think, uh, up in Waukegan. And uh, we're having them in each of the counties. So if you have locations that you think we should be at to talk to people, please do let us know. Uh, we'll also be giving you an update in September and throughout your meetings throughout the fall. And we will have uh, the draft plan ready to go for public comment in early December. So many opportunities for people to engage. On the next slide, we want to note also that we're not only asking for engagement, but we're also trying to continue to build this coalition of stakeholders that we've started to build through the working groups. And we have many partnership opportunities for people. Uh, one is to uh, help promote the engagement opportunities that we do have and the products of the plan that I mentioned on the last slide. The next is to volunteer to actually uh, partner on advocacy and action items and endorse parts of the plan. So we're making that option available to stakeholders. And the third is to really participate in some follow-on discussions. We will we have a bit of a roadshow planned where we'll be going out and talking to folks throughout the region. So if you think there are stakeholders who we've already met with who want to talk more or stakeholders we've not met with that we should be speaking with, please do let us know and we'll make sure to get out to them. Um, with that, uh, that completes my update, and I'd be happy to take any other thoughts at this time. Go ahead, Director Griffin. Yeah, maybe just a comment. I just wanted to congratulate you all for this process. The uh, Having been engaged, uh, I, I can speak specifically around Bill and Peter, but uh, very well-structured process, very well-executed process. The engagement, the way you drew everybody in was, was excellent. Um, and then the cross-section of, of voices. It was just great to sit in and hear 
you know, across that that whole kind of range of potential, you know, riders and constituents that, that were uh, weighing in. So I think this was a very well conducted process. I think the output's going to be really valuable to us. So thank you all for such an excellent job. Thank you. We really appreciate it. It's the first time we've done something like this, and it, it was really uh, interesting to see people show up and to engage with us. That was really great to see, and we're really grateful to have a fan, an awesome finance team, an awesome comms team, an awesome set of consultants helping us out. So uh, we appreciate their help and are glad to hear that from you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, all three of you uh, and everyone else involved. It's awesome. Yes, Director Lewis. Uh, Jill, uh, this may be a question for Jill. Just one uh, last question. Um, the Biden package came out a little bit late. It was started as a much larger package, came out smaller, but did come out. As you looked at the strategic plan, did you incorporate any of that in your original thinking and then you had to adjust or was it uh, there was a placeholder for whatever might be provided from the package, and you put that in there as part of the funding. Just the timing on that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think we're all grateful for the additional resources, and I think it's kind of aligning with where we're trying to go with the with the strategic plan as well as with the capital programming process. So I think as those resources come online, as we develop the strategic plan, we will see how these, these things continue to align and how we can take advantage of trying, hopefully drawing down those resources as well. So was the plan then independent of what the um, package was going to be? Did you draw the plan up not really knowing or not really thinking about it? Or uh, I just tried to trying to figure out how that how that worked. I think from from my perspective, it, it incorporates that. Um, I think, as you will see, we you know, the financial issues that we're facing and then actually the list that we have for advocacy and action steps, all of those things cost money. Right. So I think the more resources that come online, the more we are aligned with the policies that that are coming out of the federal government and the state um, that will just try to continue to do that. I think so. Yeah, I think it's aligned. And, and I'll just add that. You know, the plan isn't written yet. So we're, this is sort of, we're just sort of midway through pulling this plan together. So I think we've got time to now more specifically respond to and incorporate these funding packages that have come out sort of sub since we began the work. Um, but Jill is exactly right. I mean, we, we've known of these things. You don't necessarily know the dollar amount. And a strategic plan isn't necessarily going to line item individual dollar amounts for individual grant programs. That sort of falls into more of our ongoing capital planning and budgetary work. But they do dovetail and they come together. So the timing, I think, is good for us to have perhaps a little more certainty on at least where the federal government is thinking about funding opportunities. That's a great question. Got it. And one online. Thank you very, very much. Awesome work. Moving on, item 6C is the presentation of the RTA's 2023 to 2025 FTA triennial DBE goals. And uh, Nadine, you want to reintroduce Colette to us? I will. Good morning again, Chairman and Directors. As you're aware, the RTA and the service boards are recipients of federal funds and are required to maintain a DBE program. It's also a requirement of the RTA Act that we maintain a similar parallel program applicable to the RTA state-funded contracts. The law requires that our goals be supported by statistical analysis and adhere to a specific calculation methodology. We employ the services of Colette Holt and Associates to assist us in that process. In the interest of additional transparency, Ms. Holt is here today to explain, well, she's not physically here, she's here online, uh, to explain the somewhat complicated process of reviewing and renewing our triennial DBE goal. Um, just by way of background, for the public's sake, she's a Yale undergrad and University of Chicago law grad. She started her career um, in law as a law clerk to former chief judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. She then has deep experience practicing both in the private and public sectors. She was chief operating officer of the Chicago Park District um, and a senior attorney wow. for the city of Chicago. Uh, she spent more than 20, maybe 30 years, of her career designing, <laughs> implementing, and defending affirmative action programs. And in fact, she was instrumental in successfully defending an attack on IDOT's DBE program. Um, I think that was about 15 years ago when I was there. Um, the case that has become seminal in establishing the law for affirmative action in contracting in this circuit. 
Uh, it's the Northern Contracting case for those who are lawyers. She's the general counsel of the American Contract Compli Compliance Association and has been an adjunct professor at both Loyola and John Marshall Schools of Law. She really is the recognized expert in this area. So without further ado, Colette Holt will present the RTA's Trannial DB goal methodology, which was submitted to the FTA on July 30th. Well, thank you, Nadine. That's a lovely introduction, and it's always uh, good to be back at the RTA. Uh, I've been working with, with you for a very long time now, starting back when Paula Thiebault was there, for anybody who remembers back that far. Um, and it's always delightful to do that and, and to work with my friends Nadine and, and, La, and Latoya Red. So thank them to, uh, thanks to them for all their help. So we'll move quick, quickly through the slides. I'm, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. Um, wanted to start with just a quick overview of the DBE program, because I understand that several of the directors are new. Um, and may not be as conversant as, as some of the, uh, the people who have been around for a while about how the program actually works. Um, as Nadine mentioned, um, you are required as a condition of the receipt of money from the Federal Transit Administration to administer a DBE program for your federal aid contracts. You also, of course, uh, run a very similar uh, program for your non-federal aid contracts. So you see there the objectives of the DBE program. I, I won't read them all. Um, but overall, really, it's to ensure that there's a level playing field and non-discrimination in the award and implementation of contracts funded uh, with U.S. DOT money. Um, your program must be flexible. Um, and this is an important point when it comes to sometimes interacting with, with the public and community members, um, that you really can't run a quota program. Uh, the regulations don't permit it. I think it's very clear at this point that the federal courts would never tolerate um, some type of quota or set aside, and you must use race neutral measures to the maximum feasible extent. Next slide, please. Again, so an important point that, that for your DBE program, unlike for some of the, the local programs, um, a firm can only be certified if it is owned by a socially and economically disadvantaged individual. Um, the regulations do list the racial and ethnic groups uh, that are presumptively um, uh, disadvantaged along with white women. Uh, your firm, if you're an applicant, must uh, have gross receipts under a certain size limit, uh, and the applicant owner um, must be economically disadvantaged, um, and this is defined um, by a personal uh, net worth uh, limit. Um, there is now out a notice of proposed rulemaking from USDOT that has lots of implications for the DBE program. Um, and Nadine, I'm, I'm Latoya, I'm working on a little summary. Happy to just share that with you. I'm, I'm doing it for all my clients because it's really quite a lengthy document. But one thing to know is that they are changing and loosening some of those standards so that hopefully some of our successful DBEs will be able to stay in the program a little bit longer. Next slide, please. So the requirement for RTA uh, for this triennial goal setting um, is that uh, it must develop um, a proposed goal um, and submit it uh, to FTA for review and approval. There's a two-step process for this, um, first developing um, a baseline, and I'll go through that quickly, and then um, adjusting that um, for any other um, uh, factors that are relevant to what your goal should be. Um, certainly um, important to keep in mind that the triennial goal is not the goal that applies to particular contracts. It's the number that you're going to try to reach over the next three years on your FTA assisted contracts. But on any particular uh, contract, um, especially those that may come uh, before the board, um, do know that uh, that triennial goal really has nothing to do with it. Um, it has to be based on the scopes of, of work of that particular contract. Next slide, please. There is a public consultation requirement um, that recipients must have direct interactive um, um, interactions uh, with, with the public um, and have some type of, of real um, dialogue with the community. I was interested in listening to your community outreach and um, the ways that you're reaching the public. So this is right in line with, with that same philosophy of, of asking people um, what they think and, and what information they can uh, provide to the agency. So you see there um, the type of information that, that we ask about, the availability of DBEs and other firms, uh, what about discrimination in the ongoing uh, contracting market, and what efforts would be useful uh, to help DBEs to grow and thrive in a level playing environment. Next slide, please. 
So um, we did the, the work for you all and uh, uh, proposed that uh, the overall goal for the next three years would be 18.5% uh, for your federally assisted contracts. Um, the regulations do require that you estimate the amount of uh, participation that you will get through so-called race neutral means, um, which basically just means anything that would assist all small firms uh, and compare that to your estimate of the participation you expect to achieve through race conscious measures, which essentially means contract goals. Um, and just know that in the federal regs, race neutral does include gender neutral as well. Next slide, please. So here's the two-step process. Um, the first step is to calculate a step one base figure of the percentage of ready, willing, and able uh, minority and women-owned firms um, divided over all firms. So it, it's just you know basically fourth grade arithmetic here, pretty simple. Um, the second step is to examine all the relevant evidence um, that would reflect uh, what you would expect in a, a non-discriminatory environment um, and what would uh, DBE availability be but for um, discrimination. Um, now, I kind of buried some of the difficulty of that step one base figure, but, uh, but we'll talk in just a second about how we did that. Next slide, please. So here's how we came up with the step one figure. Um, we used the um, Directory for Illinois of Certified DBEs. Um, the RTA is a signatory to that. You do not do your own certifications, for which you should be duly grateful, um, but uh, you do use the certifications um, with your sister agencies. Um, we then um, divided that over um, the Census Bureau's county business pattern data. This is a, a database that is regularly updated by the census uh, to give you an idea of what firms are available in what industries in your market area. Um, and when we did that, we had to project out what you were going to spend for the next three years in specific industries. So you can see actually in the document that there's a, a formula there that we weighed everything. Um, you can see how we came up with it. But our step one base calculation turned out to be 22% even. Next slide, please. So again, the regulations require that we uh, take a look at all types of evidence that might affect that step one base figure. So one thing to look at is the uh, capacity of DBEs, um, which we look to the past uh, participation for, um, other agencies disparity studies, um, and statistical and other information from related fields. Next slide, please. So here are the calculations that we made to the step one base figure. Uh, the current capacity uh, of DBEs um, is defined by FTA as the median participation for the last five years. And so you see there um, that turns out to be 15%. Um, the last couple of years, um, uh, RTA has, has done extraordinarily well, I would say, in um, using DBEs at 32 and 26%. Um, that, that's really quite exemplary and I think demonstrates the hard work and the outreach that you've been doing. Next slide, please. So we did a final adjustment. Um, we took the step one base figure of 22%, the median past DB participation of 15%. FTA guidance tells us to simply add those together and average them, um, and 18.5% is what you get. Next slide, please. So then we had to go back to this projection of the amount of participation um, we would expect to get using race neutral or race conscious uh, measures. And again, you go uh, back to your participation for the last few years. What was your race neutral utilization? What was your race conscious utilization? And you see there in the, in the chart um, that the median participation was 4%. Next slide, please. So some other factors we need to take into account. Um, the amount by which past goals were exceeded. Conversely, um, the amount by which uh, past goals were not achieved. We didn't really think that that changed our analysis, and so we didn't um, uh, uh, make any changes on that basis. And so the projection is 4% race neutral participation with the remainder of your 18.5% goal being 14.5%. Next slide, please. So once we put all that together, um, there was a public consultation as was required. Um, uh, RTA pu published a, a notice um, in various uh, public uh, uh, forums and newspapers. And you can see that in the goal submission. 
uh, and the public comment period was extended to make sure that everyone still had an opportunity to weigh in. Uh, we held two uh, virtual public consultation meetings on July uh, 21st and then June 24th. 53 uh, groups were invited, um, as well as DBEs in the relevant industries. Um, and uh, we received exactly three comments. Next slide, please. So there were no changes to be made based on the comments. Um, and um, RTA submitted the, the final goal um, to FTA on July 30th. Um, it really wasn't due till August 1st, so you were a little ahead of the game. And FTA approval is pending. I think that's it, yes. One more slide. I think that was it. I think that's it. All right. So questions? Thanks, Colette, for that. Um, I did want to make one follow on comment. I know the director and has a question. Um, one thing that it's really important to remember in case anyone is wondering, our goal is not the same as the service board's goal. Yeah, um, they each create their own independent goals as they are direct recipients of federal funds. Um, and then two, as Colette just mentioned, FTA approval is still pending. So the goal that we've proposed is just that it's a proposal. It could change um, based upon the FTA's review. So we are awaiting approval. And with that, we'll take any questions, or Colette will take questions. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Holt. Um, you are certainly a subject matter expert on this, and I appreciate all your hard work. It's an incredible report, and I know I've uh, worked with you on a couple of panels for other agencies as well. Um, just for clarification, what constitutes good faith efforts? Oh, sure. Um, and let me give a little bit of context, perhaps, for the others who are not as um, conversant with the regulations as you are. Um, the, the, the regulations and the federal courts, again, require that you cannot run your program as a quota or a set aside. So what this means is that a bidder or proposer that does not meet the goal in the contract solicitation, um, but who demonstrates that they made a good faith effort to do so, but fell short, is still eligible for award. Um, and there's quite extensive guidance uh, in the federal regulations um, about good faith efforts. Um, Appendix A goes into exhaustive detail about all of the steps uh, that a proposer or bidder should take to establish its good faith efforts. Um, but if in fact it does that to the satisfaction of the agency, even if it did not meet the goal, um, then it remains eligible for contract award. Thank you. Um, second question, um, and I know the caps have changed. Uh, can you confirm what the gross annual revenue is over a period of time? Is it aggregated in mm -hmm. order to qualify as a DBE firm? Yes, the way it works is, um, and it's now five years, it used to be three, um, is that uh, you submit your, your corporate tax returns or, or partnership or, or whatever um, uh, legal structure you have, um, and those gross receipts are then added up and then averaged. Um, and if the gross receipts um, or number of employees, actually, because some of some of the, the industries uh, go by employees, but we'll, we'll stick with gross receipts for now. Um, but if your gross receipts exceed uh, the SBA cap um, on an average basis for five years, then the firm is no longer considered to be a small business concern. And being a small business concern is a um, requirement for continued eligibility for DBE certification. What's that number? Well, it varies. It varies, um, okay. And, right, right. And the SBA regulations, um, they run by six digit North okay. American industry classification systems. And so they, they do vary across different, different industries. Okay, and last question on, on an individual basis, what's mm -hmm. that net worth or is that change? Well, it hasn't changed yet. Okay. Um, it's 1.32 million as we speak today. The pending, uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking um, seeks to index that from 2011, which was the last time, uh, unbelievable almost, but the last time that that number was raised. And so it comes to about, I think it's 1.62 million um, if you average um, forward. So that's the proposed number for now, but um, that is still pending. Thank you. Excellent report. Appreciate Thank it. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, we've got two questions. Go ahead, Chairman. I'll let you call on folks. <laughs> um, Director Holt. Um, 
Good morning, and thank you. I just had a quick question of clarification about the race neutral and race conscious goals. Are they subsets that are targets of uh, in and of themselves within the overall goal, or are they just mm -hmm. guidelines that um, are intended to help achieve the overall 18.5% goal? Well, I, I would say kind of both. I mean, they are subsets in the sense that you are hoping, expecting, and will work towards getting at least 4% of your DBE participation through race neutral measures. Um, but there's no such thing kind of as a race neutral goal. Um, you know, conceptually, a goal is not race neutral because we're asking you to, in fact, make affirmative efforts to utilize uh, DBEs. But but it, it's sort of a target. Um, and, and race neutral participation um, can be uh, measured both as participation that um, you got for a contract that perhaps had no goal, um, and certainly that participation would be race neutral. Uh, the FDA counts participation over the amount of the goal as race neutral. So if your goal on the contract was 15% and the, the, the uh, bidder achieved 20, um, you got 5% race neutral uh, participation. So there are different ways to count it, um, but that's the target that you should be aiming for. And so in the years that, um, well, so let me step back. I had noticed with the RTA in the last couple of years that the race neutral, um, the number that was achieved was actually much greater and the race, race conscious uh, number was lower. Are there consequences to that or? Well, there, potentially not there, there, there could goals? be mm -hmm. um, in, the set, in, in that the regulations do say that if you exceed your goal for, um, I think it's two consecutive years, um, you really need to take another look at whether perhaps you need to, you know, to lower your goal. Um, and and, and uh, Latoya may know more than I do on this, but my understanding is that the reason that you had such excellent race neutral participation um, for those couple of years is because there were DBEs that received contracts as prime consultants and vendors. And so that would all be counted as race neutral participation. Um, you know, the RTA doesn't have that many federally funded contracts. And so you can get these wide swings um, from year to year. It's not like CTA. You know, we're just going to have this steady, steady stream of contracts. So um, that's why I think they, they like us to take a look at the median. It gives us a little better idea of what would happen if you kind of smooth out things over, over a period of time. Great. Thank you. Great. Dr. Lewis. Uh, thank you. I just wondered if there's a program uh, we engage in DBA activity to support, grow, and sustain um, uh, businesses that fall in those categories. But we never hear much about some of the good that comes from um, making that initiative happen. So uh, the question is, do we have any kind of program that on a post work basis talks about the benefit or shares information about uh, how that actually um, uh, multiplied and created positive impact in that community for this initiative? Because sometimes you have an initiative, you do it because it's a compliance matter, but we really have a bigger goal, but I don't know if it ever gets talked about. Well, I think it depends kind of what you mean about when you say it gets talked about. Um, certainly, there are many DBE success stories. And um, you know, the service boards, because they just have so many more contracts and a much bigger team and, and whatnot, um, certainly do, do publicize that. Um, and um, try to work with firms. The, the CTA actually has a new um, initiative that I just literally learned about yesterday um, that um, is, is, uh, is kind of a capacity building program that they're working with individual firms. It sounds very exciting and, and I'm really looking forward to see uh, what they're able to do with that. So I think people do talk about uh, the benefits. Um, not to put it really in a negative light, but, but certainly the one thing that we do see is that when there are not goals, minorities and women usually get no work. So to the extent that we know that the program is successful and that it is giving opportunities to firms that might otherwise be shut out, um, I think we could all say that it's successful. Director Lewis, I'd like to add to that. Obviously, the overall goal of DBE programs and similar programs throughout the country is to eliminate race-based and gender-based discrimination. Obviously, we haven't achieved that yet. Um, federal law requires that we continue to have a statistical basis for the goals that we do set. So in our case, um, Colette's firm conducted an availability study, otherwise known as a disparity study, and we're required to do that every few years or so. There's no specific time limit for how long that study is good, but 
we continue to analyze the community and the utilization of minority and women-owned firms um, to see where we are in terms of progress. So mm -hmm. as you can see, the stats indicate that our goal should still be at 18 and a half percent at this time. Mm -hmm. Nadine, Hopefully. the other thing I would I would add is to tout your 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 outreach efforts um, that um, for an agency to say that doesn't have that many federal contracts, um, but um, Ms. Red is out at things all the time. You participate in the transit symposium. I know you work with your sister agencies um, to get people um, into your contracting opportunities and make them aware of, of what you do have. So um, I, I think RTA has a good reputation in Chicago uh, for being an agency that's good to work with, that you pay on time. Always people love good. that. <laughs> yes, yes. I've never had any trouble getting paid. Let me say that right up front. Um, but it's really important because some uh, local agencies in Chicago uh, don't pay so much on time. But I, I think that you are out there in the community. And so, I, um, you know, any way to celebrate your achievements, I think, would be quite welcome. Well, thank you all for your support and for listening to this report. All right. Thank you, guys. Talk to you Thanks. later, Nadine. Thank you, Colette, for being here. All right. Here. Everybody Colette. have a good day. Thank you. And Bye. And LaToya and Nadine. Thank you Thank very you. much. All right. Item 6D is the quarterly performance report for the second quarter of 2022. Peter, good morning. Yes, good morning, Chairman, board members. Um, Again, I'm Peter Farrenwald, Manager of Strategic and Corridor Planning at RTA, and I'm here to present the year-to-date performance results through the second quarter of 2022 in comparison to 2021. Next slide. So we, we continue to use the three goals from Invest in Transit, our last regional transit strategic plan to structure our quarterly reports. Now, we'll discuss service boards, um, operational and financial performance within the context of each strategic goal as well as use a spotlight to focus on projects or programs related to each goal. And within this presentation, we make comparisons to 2021 when vaccinations were just becoming widely available. Uh, school districts were still conducting remote learning and Illinois was still under significant capacity limitations and mask mandates. And in 2022, we see that most restrictions have been lifted. Schools have been back in session and employers are welcoming back employees to their offices. Next slide. So our first strategic goal is deliver value on our investment and it focuses on two key questions. Did we get more funding and are we efficient stewards of the funding funds that we have? Next slide. And for this goal, goal, we monitor progress by tracking capital and operating funding and expenditures. And looking at annual results, capital funding decreased by 607 million from 2021. And as I mentioned in the last quarterly presentation, this large year to year over year over year decrease stems from the granting of all the remaining Rebuild Illinois bond funds in the first quarter of 2021, which totaled $2.6 billion in funding between 2020 and 2021. So year to date, uh, capital expenditures of 554 million was an 8% increase from 2021, a difference of $42 million. And expenditures are, expenditures are increasing as the service boards move from design to construction on important projects that are funded with Rebuild Illinois bonds and PAYGO funds. So the system-wide operating cost per passenger trip of $10.21 was about one-third lower compared to the first half of last year. And the fare rev revenue per passenger trip of $1.54 was 12 cents higher compared to 2021. Both of these figures are significant improvements, some directly from increased ridership. Next slide. And so for our first spotlight, we'll focus on RTA issued bonds. The purpose of bond issuances was to help fill gaps in the absence of state funds to support capital projects to keep the capital program moving. And the RTA utilized its statutory authority to issue bonds in 2014, 2016, and 2018 for a total of $350 million. We had the authority to issue another round of bonds in 2020, but did not do to the influx of state money. And to date, 8.84% of funds from those three bond issuances have been expended 
295 billion out of 350 million with plans for funds to be fully expended by the end of 2023. And some of the projects using this fund bond funds include for CTA 95th Street uh, station renovation, the purchase of buses, the overhaul of buses, the blue line, your new blue projects, and purchase of snow fighter locomotives. Uh, Metro's used the funds for positive train control, replace bridges on the UP North Line, traction power augmentation on the Metro Electric, purchase of new rail cars, and the rehab of the Homewood station. And Pace has used the funds for purchasing new buses, designing a new Northwest garage, renovating the Northwest Transit Center, expanding Bolingbrook Park and Ride, and provide security enhancements system wide. So the spend down of RTA bond funds is encouraging sign of project construction and implementation. And we hope to see a similar trend in the next few years with the influx of state and federal funds and the capital programs. Next slide. So moving on, the second goal of invest in transit is build on the strengths of our network, where we ask the questions, did the region become more transit friendly and are we focusing our limited resources wisely? Next slide. And for this goal, we have been measuring vehicle revenue miles. We look at the vehicle revenue miles, which is the total miles the buses and the rail cars travel in revenue service. As this reflects the amount of service available to our riders, and the year-over-year year percent change for the last 10 years is noted above each of these bars. And the vehicle revenue miles for the first half of 2022 was 1.1% higher compared to last year. But over the 10-year time period reflected here, down 13.6% or about 16 million miles. Next slide. And our second spotlight focuses on new um, our new online portal run by the RTA to give customers access to programs that we operate. The online portal is an exciting step forward in trying to go paperless and provide more self-service options for customers to apply for replace or renew reduced fare and ride-free permits. The portal is a vast improvement over the mail and or in-person processes as online services is more timely and less cumbersome. So this portal went live on January 18th. And as you can see, the number of applications has increased each month and through June, total over 11,000 applications, which comprised 20% of all applications received. And the blue portions at the bottom of the bars illustrate the number of senior ride free and reduced fare applications. The orange sections in the middle represent disabled ride free and reduced fare applications. And the red sections at the top donate the ADA permit card replacement applications, since right now that is the only function that our ADA customers can complete through the portal at this time. So clearly our seniors are making good use of the online portal and comprise the vast majority of online applications. But the RTA has started planning for a paperless ADA paratransit application process too, and that pilot is, is anticipated to go live in the first quarter of next year. Next slide. And the third goal is, is stay competitive, which asks, are we providing the kind of services that people want to ride? And are people satisfied with it when they do? Next slide. And for this goal, we track ridership, as well as metrics related to speed and reliability. Uh, system by ridership at the first half of this year was 131.9 million, 41.1 million higher compared to the first half of last year. It's an increase of 43.7%. And the system-wide average speed was 15.1 miles per hour, 33.5% 33 higher compared to last year. And the first half on-time performance was 82% for CTA bus, up 2.5 percentage points, and 53% for CTA rail, a decrease of 5.3 percentage points. And Metro reported higher on-time performance in 2022 by half a percentage point and exceeding its target of 95 percent. A pace on bus on time performance was not available at this time. Next slide. And so for our third spotlight, uh, we'd like to give you an update on our most recent customer satisfaction survey effort. Uh, although the results aren't quite ready yet, the full reports will be coming in the next couple of months. But today we'd like to give you an update on how we executed the survey and, and our plans to move forward with, with future surveying. And as a quick background, the RTA has led large scale system wide customer satisfaction surveys over the years in 2011, 2013, 2016. 
And we started another round in 2019, and we're just about to start onboard surveying in March 2020 when COVID hit. So we restarted the project in late last year, and we're able to complete online and in-person surveying this spring. And our vendor is just starting to produce the written report, which will be released this fall. But we started the survey as we have in the past with an online component, which was intended to gather as many responses as possible and give us some direction as to where to focus our resources for the in-person component. Writers were approached through this use of carefully curated venture and service board email lists and via general website appeals. The CTA supplemented their online effort with an onboard survey and through handouts at a number of bus routes and rail lines. Metro supplemented their online effort by handing out postcards at downtown Metro stations, which included survey links with unique passwords. And PACE also um, used onboard surveying. So in total, over 54,000 54, riders were in hand a survey or postcard. And by the time the effort concluded, we had received over 17,000 valid responses. We, we were encouraged to see that nearly 10,000 of those respondents, over 71%, indicated a willingness to take part in future surveys as shown in this chart. As, as we have been reporting over the past year, we've been testing the waters of using a customer panel to respond to shorter, more frequent surveys in order to get more timely data and reduce the survey burden on the respondents. But since customer panels are hard to sustain over time, we need to continually replenish our customer volunteers. And it was very encouraging to see so many indicate willingness to be a part of the future research. With that being said, our next task in continuing our customer satisfaction survey program is to examine how to proceed with future efforts. In-person surveying is expensive and demanding on personnel, cumbersome providers, shifting ridership patterns and difficulty in staffing surveyors. But online surveys are quicker to devise, easier to tailor to specific questions or regions, and much shorter to respondents to take, which increases the likelihood of them responding. However, we do need to explore how to ensure that online surveying responses represent the regions, writers, and their interests fully. But we will have more to share in the coming months on the survey results. Next slide. So in summary, the um, RTA bonds are ex being expended. The new online fare programs application process has successfully served over 11,000 customers to date, and the customer satisfaction survey is concluded with promising results for future preparation, participation in customer panels. That concludes the presentation, and I appreciate your time and attention, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Peter. Questions, comments? Yes, Director Colson. Yeah, um, I think one of your slides you indicated fair revenue per trip is a dollar fifty-four. I mean, that sounds awfully low. The CTA fare is what two fifty, and the metro fares are higher than that. How did you calculate down to one hundred and fifty-four? And maybe we're charging too little. Well, that that's the uh, average, with including the you know monthly pass riders pay less than that. Uh, you know, but three and, and three reduced fares are included. Um, so that's that's what the average of all service boards. So it's um, the CTA reduced fares, the top of the metro, full, you know, single ride, high higher price tickets. It's a bargain, great bargain. Any other questions or comments? Peter, thank you very much. Appreciate it. 7A are the resolutions certifying financial results for the second quarter of 2022. And good morning, B. twice. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. My name is B. Raina Hickey. I'm the Chief Financial Officer. So good to see everybody again. Today, I will be asking you to certify the service board's financial results through the second quarter against 2022 operating budgets adopted in May following the April funding amendment. I will also update the board on service board drawdowns of federal relief monies, followed by our focus of the month, the RTA sales tax. First, let's look at the primary metric for evaluating substantial accordance with budget, that of the operating deficit performance. Next slide, please. Let's revisit the operating deficit calculation, which measures how the service board perform as unsubsidized businesses. 
We'll use Metro's second quarter results as an example. Through the second quarter of 2022, Metro's amended budget anticipated 66.8 million of operating revenue and 448.8 million of operating expense for a balanced budget operating deficit of 382 million. Metro's actual revenue results for the second quarter of 75.3 million were 8.5 million above budget and their operating expenses of 430.2 million were under budget by 18.6 million. This produced an actual operating deficit of 355 million, which was 27 million or 7.1% unfavorable to budget. Next slide, please. In addition to Metro's 7.1% favorable operating deficit, the operating deficit results were also favorable to budget or in the green for the other service boards and the region as a whole. Pace Suburban Service and ADA Paratransit had the most favorable operating deficit results due to good expense performance relative to budget. Accordingly, staff recommends a finding of substantial accordance with budget for all. This recommendation relies solely on the operating deficit variances since the RTA region has, has been provided with recovery ratio relief through 2023. Next slide, please. Our other routine update is the status of federal relief funding. The service boards drew an excess of 67 million since our last update. And as a region, we have now drawn down 41.5% of the 3.5 billion total. At this time, relief funding is still expected to last into the 2025 budget year. Next slide, please. Now turning to our focus topic for this month, RTA sales tax, which is the primary source of public funding for our transit operations. Beginning in 1983, the RTA sales tax was originally levied at a rate of 1% in Cook County and at 0.25% in the Collar Counties. We refer to this as sales tax one. The 2008 funding and reform legislation added a quarter of a percentage point of sales tax throughout the region, referred to as sales tax two. The legislation also increased the sales tax by another quarter of a percentage point only in the collar counties to be retained by the collar county governments to support public safety and transportation related services. As a result, for our purposes, the total RTA sales tax is 1.25 for purchases made in Cook County and 0.50% in the collar counties. And as a side note, the sales tax, uh, the state sales tax holiday on groceries now in effect for state fiscal year 2023 does not extend to the RTA sales tax. So, so there should be no impact on our revenue from this holiday. Next slide, please. RTA sales tax has provided a largely stable and steadily increasing source of funding for transit. RTA sales tax revenue totaled 931 million in 2010 on the far left of the chart and grew at an average annual rate of 3.4% during the decade of the 20 teens. After a COVID related decline of about 8% in 2020, receipts rebounded sharply in 2021 and exceeded both the pre-COVID 2019 levels by 17%. This dramatic recovery was driven by both the easing of COVID restrictions and the initiation of state and local sales taxes on more online transactions but more about that in a moment. The RTA sales tax growth assumptions in the current operating budget produce levels that are expected to surpass the 1.5 billion mark in the next year or two. Next slide, please. As we have mentioned in previous meetings, staff had to do some detective work to estimate the impact of the change in state law in January 2021, which extended state and local sales taxes, including the RTA sales tax to more online transactions. Data is available from the Illinois Department of Revenue, which shows sales tax receipts by the standard industry classification or SIC code of the business collecting the sales tax. There are around a thousand of these codes, but some careful analysis in collaboration with Metro Finance staff 
isolated three SIC codes with extraordinary growth in 2021. Receipts for these three codes grew by 170% versus 2019, while all the other codes grew by a combined 9%. Staff concluded that most of the new online RTA sales tax activity resided in these three SIC codes, shifting the RTA sales tax base up by more than 100 million and increasing the 30% PTF public transportation fund match on sales tax by more than 30 million. Next slide, please. So let's wrap up the sales tax discussion. This slide provides some insight into where our sales tax funding is coming from, both geographically and by industry. Suburban, suburban Cook County, shown in blue, produced almost half of the region's RTA sales tax receipts in 2021, followed by the city of Chicago at 29% and the collar counties each at less than 10% of total. But I also wanted to give you some examples in real money. So here's the breakdown. Suburban Cook County produced 694 million, about 47%. City of Chicago produced 429 million at 29%. DuPage 128 million and 9%. Lake County 76 million at 5%, closely followed by Will at 69% at 69 million. Kane 46 million and McHenry 27 million at 2%. So by industry, the top two categories, drugs and miscellaneous and automotive and gas, each provided in excess of 300 million of sales tax receipts. One of the reasons why higher gas gasoline prices benefit transit. Interestingly, drugs and miscellaneous moved automotive as our number one category in 2021 due to the online sales tax change we discussed on the previous slide. And drugs in this contest does not include RTA sales tax on cannabis, which we estimate contributes about 10 million a year in new revenue. More details in here. Uh, in closing, we are making good progress on our focus areas, and we can now check off from the list sales tax, the largest component of operating funding. More topics are coming to the future board meetings, including state funding for operations, funding allocations, and the criteria budgets must meet for adoption. That concludes my presentation. Back to you, Mr. Chairman, for any questions the board may have with the reminder that the proposed second quarter resolutions require a vote. Thank you. Thank you, B. Questions or comments of, yes, Director Colson. Yeah, B, the RTA took a lead role recently in some of the sales tax avoidance litigation um, for the last five years or so. And I know a lot of the airlines were big offenders. And we won that case in the Illinois Supreme Court. Is there any way to quantify how that has helped sales tax receipts? Maybe maybe our council. We, we could uh, bring back to the board the specific settlements. You know, we have, of course, all the settlement data and, and what those generated. I, I don't have that offhand. Um, we could also... We don't get detail by taxpayer from the state. And so it is difficult to quantify, but we do know that by industry, it's gone up. So we could look at that and we could look at um, the specific settlements. And we shared that at one point, but it's been a few years. So probably time to do that again. Well, I would be at least be interested yeah. in seeing the numbers. I think it was a bold move on behalf of the RTA and I think it's paid off. Can you? At the time, it seemed very bold, and um, and but you know it, it resulted, as you know, in clarification of, of of the law, and increased compliance, and uh, shut down a lot of the sham operations that were throughout the various areas, and it it was to avoid paying sales tax within the counties with the higher rates for those that may not be familiar. Thank you. So. so do bring that back, B and mm -hmm. Nadine. Thank you very much. It's a great comment, Director Colson. Any other questions? If not, we need a uh, motion and a second to uh, adopt. Uh, moved by uh, Director Canty, seconded by Director Andalcio. Um, let's try this. Uh, since this is not a controversial resolution, uh, is there leave for the attendance roll call since we have an attendance roll call? All those uh, in favor, uh, say aye. 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 Excellent. Um, so leave has been granted and uh, that motion is adopted.
a resolution is adopted. Thank you. 7B is an ordinance appointing the pension trustee for Metra. And uh, Bill Lackman, uh, and I know everybody has uh, has the resume also in front of you. Bill? Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, directors. Uh, before you is a request to appoint Metra CFO John Morris to the RTA Pension Plan Board of Trustees. The RTA Pension Plan covers all RTA employees as well as non-represented employees of Metra and PACE. The membership of the Board of Trustees consists of three transit agency trustees, one each from the RTA, Metra, and PACE, and four non-employee trustees. Metra CFO John Morris would be replacing former Metra Treasurer Robert Borisek, who retired on August 1st. Mr. Morris joined Metra in July. A financial analysis executive with over 20 years of experience in financial services, Mr. Morris has served as the finance leader for the credit card portfolios of several merchants and as the CFO for J.P. Morgan Chase's U.S. commercial card business. Mr. Morris is a certified public accountant and a graduate of Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Business, the University of Southern California's Vitterby School of Engineering, and the United States Military Academy at West Point. Again, we are seeking the board's approval of an ordinance appointing Mr. Morris to the RTA Pension Board of Trustees. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions uh, on Mr. Morris? If not, how about a motion and a second to approve? Uh, Director Aldelcio moves, seconded by uh, Director Groven, that we approve uh, Mr. Morris. Uh, with that, is there leave for the attendance roll call? Leave. Seeing no objection, uh, leave is granted uh, and uh, it will be so reported. He is approved. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving along, there are items that uh, are for the approval of the Board of Contract and Expenditure items as they appear on the board agenda. Um, everybody should have these in your packet. Uh, the items for consideration include an ordinance on 7C authorizing state legislative uh, consulting contracts. Uh, these are the, there's no changes there. It's a little scale back uh, group from uh, a year or two ago. Um, item 7D are ordinances or in, an ordinance authorizing a contract for transit advocacy campaign and on-demand public relations. And 7E is uh, an ordinance amending the contract for strategic plan uh, consulting support uh, payments. And 7F are approval of travel expenses uh, for board as well as some staff members. Any questions on any of these? Uh, if not, how about um, 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 will, on this one, we will take a roll call, um, but how about a motion to adopt 7C, 7D, 7E, and 7F together? Uh, Director Lewis uh, moves, I think, seconded by Director Cotel. Uh, and with that, uh, if there's no discussion, Jeremy, will you take the roll call, please? Sure. Uh, Director Indulcio. Yes. Director Canty. Yes. Director Carey. Aye. Director Colson. Yes. Director Fuentes. Aye. Director Gavin. Aye. Director Gorman. Aye. Director Groven. Aye. Director Holt. Yes. Director Cotel. Aye. Director Lewis. Yes. Director Melvin. Yes. Director Pang. Yes. Uh, Director Ross. Yes. Chairman Dillard. Yes. 15 eyes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And so 7C, D, E, and F are approved. Thank you. Uh, item eight is new business. Any new business to uh, come before the board today for discussion only? Don't see any. Um, with that, we'll move on to adjournment. I want to remind everybody that the next meeting will be September 15th, uh, 2022 at nine o'clock uh, here. Um, Leanne, when do you think, or Jeremy, um, are we going to go back to a committee structure where we have committee meetings uh, before our board meeting in this room? Um, I, that, that's 
yours on the board's call. Um, perhaps we can have additional discussion offline and make that decision for going forward. Yeah, if if directors, um, you know, want to want to let Lee in and I know by email what your thoughts are on resuming um, committee hearings. I mean, Director Melvin is here, uh, who's our finance chair. Uh, Director Fuentes is is obviously accustomed to the old practice, um, but uh, let me know. Um, my guess is we do go back to probably committee meetings. Um, they, um, you know, they're good. Everybody can attend them, which has normally been the process. Uh, it tends to when we have committee meetings, we have a little more thorough discussion sometimes of uh, of, of things, and then it, it I would say for lack of a better word, speeds up the the, 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 the full board meeting sometimes um, because everybody generally attends um, all of the committee hearings. But let me know your thoughts. Uh, but now that we're quasi back to normal, uh, um, you know, I'd appreciate your, your input on that. Um, all right, if there's no further business to come before the public session of the Board of Directors, again, it's great to see um, those of you who are here in person. Uh, kudos to our IT team back there uh, who have made this uh, pretty seamless today. Really, really appreciate all the effort that uh, has gone into making these meetings. These are not easy to do uh, and very much appreciate everybody's patience uh, in these very, very strange times uh, that we're operating under, um, but we're getting back to normal. Um, with that, uh, how about a motion and a second to adjourn? Um, Director Groven moves, we adjourn. Lots of hands. Director of the Director of Melvin wants to go home. Uh, he has seconded. Uh, with that, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. The ayes have it, and we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>